Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. The believers share their possessions. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the, the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Here ends the reading of his holy word. All right, everyone, start your clocks. You can start timing from now. Um, it's funny, uh, I, I never noticed anyone doing that, um, but I will tell you a story. As I was growing up, uh, there was a, a I, I'll, I'll say I remember him as elderly, um, an elderly man in our church um, that often led opening prayer. And he was extremely thorough in his opening prayers. And so my cousins and I, would uh, time his opening prayers each and every Sunday that he, he gave them. And the all-time record, I believe, clocked in somewhere around 20 minutes. Um, he was very, very good, very thorough. He hit everything. Um, by the time he was done, there was no need for a sermon because he had already given it through his prayer. Um, and as a child, I remember thinking, you know, wow, this is taking a very long time. But as I've grown older, um, I, I now feel like, how amazing is it that he was able to stand up there and pray like that and so openly for and for everything that he could think of and that the congregation allowed him to do so right that there was never any hey you need to tone it, it ring in a little bit when you're doing that prayer um so it's a wonderful thing when you have someone that is is that uh involved in that deeply feeling in their prayer that being said um i don't know that i'll ever match his record so good morning, everyone. I hope you all have recovered from eating all your Easter candy this week. I, um, I think we're just about out at our house. Um, I've heard that two out of four of the kids have exhausted their supply already. So they have been very busy in, in that. Um, in our sermon last week, we discussed how each of us has a place that we can belong uh, because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And during that disco discussion, I spoke briefly about how people need to know that as a community of faith, we are here for them. So this week, I would like to take some more time to discuss what it means to be a community of faith, and as such, what God believes a community of faith should look like. So first, let's start with just the words, a community of faith. Now, you may be thinking, shouldn't I just say church, right? Shouldn't you just say church? Wouldn't that be easier than uh, a community of faith? And I have to admit that I do use those two terms interchangeably. Uh, there are times when I will, from the pulpit, you know, say, uh, shouldn't we be doing this church or shouldn't we be doing that church? But I want to make a distinction today uh, a bit more clear between the two because these ideas often get confused in people's minds. So the church should really be called the community of faith. After all, a church is not a building. A church is the people in the building. But the problem is we have become so used to saying, oh, I'm going to church, or hey, just take a left up there at the church. So in our adapting language, the church building has been shortened to just the church. And in truth, the church building is just a place. It's just a place where the church meets. Or to help us better distinguish from the two, the church building is a place where the community of faith meets. Okay, got it, Pastor. We are a community of faith that meets in the church building. Peace be with you. I'll see you next week, right? 
Well, let's, let's not be so hasty. Uh, we know what we mean now when we say community of faith, so let's talk about what a community of faith should be uh, and what it should look like according to God. We get a great example of what a community of faith is called to look like and act like in our scripture for, from today. So in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, we are told, Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything that was owned was held in common. Uh, hold on a second there, Pastor. What do you mean everything was held in common? That sounds awful suspicious to me. Um, I'm not sure, but I think that just might be communism. And we would never do anything like that. Okay, everyone relax, because what I'm about to say might sound strange at first, but if that's what you're thinking, you are correct. Um, yes, that is indeed a form of communism. Now, it is not the communism as we think of the word today. It is not a communism that you see in China or the former, former Soviet Union. It is not a political system that is put in place to rule a country. It is not communism with a big C, but it is communism with a little C. See, it is a group of people living together and pulling all that they have together with one another. And for the first century Christians, this was necessary. They were being persecuted left and right. I know you have all heard the phrase, there is safety in numbers. Well, that was a part of it for them. And the other part is they were so committed to Jesus and to his teachings that they wanted to make sure that they were taking care of one another. Now, what I find interesting about that first line and uh, of the scripture from today, when it is read and when we study it, we almost always go to that second part of the scripture and no one claimed any ownership of any possessions. But I believe the focus should be on the first part of that verse. The whole group of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. So if we are looking to what God calls us to be as a community of faith, then that is a good place to start. Being of one heart and one soul. Now, does it say that they always agreed? Does it say that they didn't have friction from time to time? No, it does not. What it says is they were one heart and one soul. They were a people focused on one thing. And that one thing was following what Jesus had called them to do. So that is the best place for a community of faith to start. Moving on in verse 33, with great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. A community of faith gives their testimony gives their testimony about Jesus and what he has done for them. They do not hold themselves up inside the walls of the church building. They go out and they tell others, and more importantly, they go out and they show others who Jesus is. And if a community of faith is ever to grow, that is necessary. But more importantly, if a community of faith is going to claim that they are following the words of Jesus then it must be willing to share them with others. Now, our next two verses tie together very closely. They were not, uh, in 34, there was not a needy person among them. For as many owned lands and houses, they sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid them at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. And again, you might be saying, whoa, 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 pastor, we are veering into some uncomfortable territory with that, that part of scripture. Are you saying that I need to go out and sell everything I own and give it to the church? No, that is not the point here. The point is a community of faith cares for one another and helps one another 
when there is a need. Now, these first century Christians, they were so devoted to this idea that they were willing to do that, to sell all they had, to give up their homes and lands to help others in their community. And they gave that money to the apostles so that they could distribute it where it was needed. A community of faith, in a community of faith, that focus should go away from this idea of what is it that I need to the idea of what is it that this community needs. See, in doing so, uh, in focusing on what needs to be done in order for the community of faith to grow, that is what is done to help serve what God needs. So now that we know what a community of faith should look like and some basic ideas of what it should be doing, let's talk about why a community of faith is important. Well, a community of faith is important for several reasons. First, a community of faith is there to help one another. We have heard how far the early Christians were willing to go in order to help each other. Well, we are called to, be make, to make sure we are doing the same thing, supporting one another in all the things we face in this world. I want to let you guys in on a little secret here. Something that I have discovered in my 40 years on earth. And it's something that I don't think everyone else might know. And it is this. This is a very big secret. Are you ready? Life is hard. Did you guys know that? That life is hard? I'm sure that you do, right? Uh, sometimes life is really hard. However, having others around you that are willing to help and support you in those difficult times can make it much easier in those hard times. So I pray that is what we are doing for one another, helping each other during those times when we know our brothers and sisters are struggling. Second, a community of faith helps to keep us on the right track. It allows us to make sure we are following the words of Jesus. A community that is open and willing to say with love that we are worried someone might be heading in the wrong way is a good thing. But again, it is important that we do so with love, not jealousy, not judgment, not out of a sense of our own greatness. It has to come from a place of love and concern. And third, a community of faith is indispensable when it comes to helping us grow as Christians. Once I was in a uh, class and we were talking about this idea and the idea was this. Uh, someone asked a question, can a person be a Christian if they are not part of a community of faith? And there was some very good discussion around this, and some felt that yes, it is possible. Others felt that no, it, it is not possible. And, and I fall into the yes, a person can be a Christian and not be part of a community of faith camp. I know that's something that a pastor is not supposed to say from the pulpit, right? But... While I do believe that you are capable of being a Christian and not part of a community of faith, and, and I will tell you why I believe that, because our salvation is not found because we come inside these walls on Sunday, right? Our salvation is found in our belief in Jesus, and that is very much a personal thing. It is something that is just between that person and Jesus. So with that being said, it is possible, but it is so much harder to try and be a Christian on your own than instead of being a part of a community of faith. It is harder to stay upon the path. It is harder to face the world, and it is much harder to grow in your faith if you are trying to do it all alone. So while it is indeed possible, it is much harder to do it on your own. So as a community of faith, I am hoping that this day we can all agree that we will strive to be what Jesus has called us to be, a group of one heart and one soul caring for one another, helping one another to stay on the path that follows Jesus with love 
taking our testimony about what he has done to all the world, not for our glory, but for his. My challenge for you this week is this. Who do you know that needs a community of faith? Invite them to join ours. Amen.